All right. Uh, I've got a new homework assignment that I'm going to give you at the end of class today, homework number five. It has to do with rainfall, which is what we're going to be talking about today and uh, on Thursday. And our midterm exam is a week from today. That will be in class. It will cover the lectures from the beginning of the semester through Thursday's lecture. It will have both problem solving and it will also have uh, conceptual questions. And it will include um, things related to the uh, software that you've learned so far. So I recommend that you bring your own computer for obvious reasons if you've got one. And if not, arrive early. Um, it helps to get the computer situated if you're here before class begins. Um, so we're going to look at a few things that help describe the importance of water in the environment. Here are some pictures of flooding in West Virginia. And West Virginia is definitely not the only place in the world that experiences problematic flooding. But these photos will give you an idea of what happens when there's too much water and why we bother studying the hydrologic cycle. You can see that cars are underwater, foundations are threatened by the flow. In fact, entire villages and towns can be submerged when the waters come through. And uh, it's actually dangerous from a health standpoint, too. Here in West Virginia, in Huntington, in fact, the Friday before the semester began, there was uh, flooding here in town. And one of the issues is people were sort of playing around, wading through the water, but their sewage mixed in with the water. And so it, in addition to causing structural damage, it can also be a public health concern. So we know that hydrology is important in wet climates, but it's also important in dry climates, in arid regions, where you'd think that there isn't very much precipitation. And so maybe hydrology isn't important there. But in fact, when there is precipitation, much of it will happen all in a very short period of time. And these are some photos that I took when I was living in the United Arab Emirates. And you can see this is a very large trapezoidal channel. The width of this channel is probably four or five meters. And the water comes out of these mountains that are um, very sparsely vegetated. And when it rains, there's hardly any infiltration because the uh, soil is uh, hard packed, it's very rocky, and there's very little vegetation to aid infiltration. And so it just discharges right into the sea. Um, they attempt to capture as much of the rainwater as they can in just a handful of groundwater recharge reservoirs like this. But because of evaporation, they lose most of it before they're able to make use of it for agricultural reasons. Um, this is showing in the UAE what happens when it does rain. It was very hard for me to live there because uh, after too much sunshine, I get a little bit crazy. I just get bored with it always being sunny. So it's only rainy for about one week per year. And it's just sort of a little bit cloudy. And then it will pour rain. And they, in, in the UAE, it seems crazy to put in storm drains because it rains so rarely. But then when it does rain, there's no storm drains and parking lots get submerged and it's a very costly problem. Uh, this is a brand new car. You can, if you look through the window, you can see they still have the plastic on the seats. And so now it's completely submerged and probably not going to be drivable any longer. Uh, here's some photos of taxis driving down the road where maybe they should be using boats. Here's one person's solution to, you know, if you don't have an umbrella, maybe you could wear a garbage bag to keep dry. I was driving in the opposite direction, so I didn't see if he had a hole for breathing, but I hope so, <laughs> because you could get asphyxiated pretty quickly. Um, in the UAE, they, like I mentioned, very few places have storm drains, and they just have this recurring problem where even along the major freeways, there are low points. You know, the underpass in Huntington that goes under the railroad tracks at uh, 10th and Hal Greer, there are several places where you have to go under the tracks in Huntington. And at least we have some drains there to take the water out. They fill up, but on some of the major roadways in the UAE, they don't have any drainage at all. And so those low points in the freeway just get totally full of water. And they have to have trucks go and suck the water out. And then the trucks will drive to the desert and just discharge that stormwater into the desert. It's kind of pandemonium when that's happening because people can't see very well since it's raining. The roads are slippery. People aren't used to driving in the water. 
And this is one of those pump trucks that got in a head-on collision, ran into another pump truck, and there you know, used to be a place to drive this thing around in front, but it's just completely been smashed. Um, even the, the nice multi-million dollar villas in Dubai suffer from poor drainage, and this is one of the neighborhoods that's very, very exclusive near the beach. And you can see there's just a lot of puddling uh, after, and this is a couple of days after a major rainstorm. This is a picture of on campus where I was. You can see that uh, they put in these speed bumps to try and keep people from driving too quickly. And the water depth here was maybe around two feet deep. And so you, you sort of get stuck on campus because the water uh, gets stopped by the speed bumps and it has nowhere to flow. This is another picture of campus, and um, this is polished granite that they have all over campus for the walkways instead of concrete. And that polished granite is very, very slippery when it's wet, and it wasn't uncommon to see people falling down, sprawled out. And, and I, was, I almost did that several times because I wore slippery dress shoes, and it was a bad combination. So we've talked about the connection between hydrology and hydraulic engineering in previous lectures, and um, what we've identified is that hydrology feeds the answer to the hydraulic engineer. Where hydrology is, um, I, I printed these double-sided, by the way, if you didn't already notice that. Um, hydrology says what the flow rates will be, either flow over the surface or flow under the surface. And then the hydraulic engineer uses that to solve problems of open channel flow, like what would be the depth through a channel or pipe flow. Um, which would be what is the uh, pressure change as water goes through a pipeline. Uh, this diagram shows some of the movement of water through the environment, and it shows conceptually that everything comes back to the ocean, that there is evaporation from the ocean that's driven by radiation from the sun, and that evaporation causes condensation in the form of clouds and wind, transports those clouds over the land, and there can be precipitation in a variety of forms. It can be liquid rainfall, it can be uh, snow onto uh, mountains, or not necessarily mountains, there can be snowfall, uh, but there can also be icy fogs that cause the accumulation of moisture at ground level. And then when the water gets onto the surface, it, it will either run over the surface and be intercepted by streams and in, in concentrated flow, where we analyze the movement of that water by open channel hydraulic equations. Or the water, if it infiltrates, travels through the subsurface. And there are equations that we'll learn at the end of the semester, just very briefly, that describe how easily water moves through the subsurface. And so it's important to understand um, the basics of this cycle, and since Earth's atmosphere is a closed system, there is a no net gain or loss in water over time. Uh, this water cycle image is similar, but it shows a couple more um, components of how water is moving around. It shows, for example, the process of sublimation and desublimation, where sublimation is the evaporation straight from ice to uh, water vapor, not going through a liquid phase, and desublimation is the reverse of that. A uh, very little bit of water comes from deep underneath the Earth's surface through volcanic eruptions, and steam can be released in the atmosphere when there's a volcanic eruption. It's not just all rock. There is some water that gets caught up in that process. Um, but the bulk of the water, these thick arrows, are shown as evaporation from the oceans, and precipitation onto the surface. If we want to look at it on a quantitative basis, you know, how much water is moving and where is it going? This diagram is nice because it's putting some numbers in. It's saying that for 100 units of precipitation onto land, there have to be 424 units of evaporation from the ocean. And the reason for that is that most precipitation that will occur will go right back into the ocean directly. It will rain onto the surface of the ocean rather than the surface of the land. Um, this is also showing on a relative basis how much of the water gets back into the ocean from surface flow versus groundwater flow. And so most of the water is flowing over the surface. 38 units will re-enter the ocean 
as surface flow compared to only one unit of moisture moving back into the ocean in the form of groundwater flow. So this figure is good for giving you an idea of the relative quantities of evaporation versus precipitation. And then this is on an absolute basis rather than a relative basis. This is showing the actual volumes of water moving around and uh, sinks and um, or rather uh, like permanent locations for water and then how much it moves on an annual basis. And uh, so, for example, the oceans have 1.3 million cubic meters of water. That's the volume of all the oceans combined, 1.3 million cubic meters, uh, cubic kilometers. And so on an annual basis, there will be 505,000 um, cubic kilometers of evaporation and then 458,000 cubic kilometers of precipitation directly back into the ocean. And so the difference between these two is how much precipitation is available onto the ground surface. And it shows how much water is caught up in glaciers. And this is where this slide actually shows its age a little bit. Uh, this data is from 1983. And you'll notice that they show the volume on an annual basis coming out of glaciers is equal to the volume coming into glaciers. And unfortunately, that's no longer true. Nowadays, there's more water coming out of glaciers than there is coming back in. Um, because as the climate warms up and glaciers recede, the total volume of water that's trapped in glaciers is decreasing, and that water is being released. And so there's a net difference here. There's more coming out than going into the glaciers. So it's no longer in equilibrium. Um, it gives you an idea that there's quite a bit of groundwater available, but as we'll look at in a future slide, very, a, a large fraction of that groundwater isn't available for people to use because it's too far from the Earth's surface. You know, we can only drill down to a certain depth in order to tap groundwater, but um, much of it is very deep. So this is showing of all of the water on the Earth, 96% of it is in oceans, and a very small fraction is freshwater, about 2.5%. Of that freshwater, a lot of it is at the ice caps and in glaciers, and this isn't very convenient for people to use for drinking and irrigation because it's in the wrong place. There aren't very many people at the ice caps or living nearby glaciers. Um, some of the groundwater we're able to use, but much of the groundwater is so deep that we can't get at it. So only a tiny fraction of the fresh water is existing in rivers and lakes as surface water. That's what most of the time we exploit for our drinking water resources. And of that surface water, a lot of that even is ice and snow. You know, snow in the mountains, not necessarily a glacier, which is permanently frozen, but ice and snow that is difficult to use on an immediate basis if we want to produce drinking water from it. So this successive uh, bar chart shows you really the uh, relative uh, scarcity of fresh water compared to uh, saline water that's in the oceans. So we've talked about watersheds before and drainage basins, and a drainage basin is an area that flows to any outlet that you choose to identify. And uh, let's see, this computer's acting pretty slow today, but I'll just give it a shot because I'm feeling optimistic. We'll see if it will load. I want to show you what a watershed looks like by using a terrain model that, that's available in Google Earth. We're going to look at what's called a DEM. That's a digital elevation model. And you may already be familiar with this feature in Google Earth, but it'll take a picture and it'll put elevation data underneath the picture to try and make the picture look three-dimensional. And so I'm going to zoom in on uh, Ona, West Virginia, which is the town that I live in. A town is maybe a little bit too fancy a word for Ona, West Virginia, because there's really no civilization there. Um, all right, so let me find what I'm familiar with. Okay, here we go. So here's a watershed. Can you see the outline of this 
ridge top. The 3D looks a little bit better here than it does there, but as I rotate through, you can get a sense of where the water would flow if the raindrops were falling on the boundaries. For example, if raindrops fall over here, they're going to flow towards this other watershed. They're not going to go towards the outlet that's right here. Someone's built a house right over the creek, which is always a little bit risky but I suppose the property wasn't very expensive, so that's why they did it. But here you can see there's a watershed, and so any rain that falls here is going to drain over the surface, down through this stream, and then into a bigger stream. And so in time of concentration, which is in the first quiz I asked you about time of concentration, think about where's the furthest point. What's, if this is the outlet that I'm interested in, if I put a stream gauge right here, then how long is it going to take for water far away to travel from the furthest point in the watershed over the surface, in the channel, and down to that outlet? Time of concentration is the duration it takes for the water to flow from far away to the outlet. So that's just a brief view of a watershed. And as you can see, there's a lot more of them. There's another watershed over here. Here's a watershed. And so all of these watersheds are connected to each other. And depending on what you pick as the location of your outlet, there can be a, a big area upstream of that or a small area upstream of that. And this diagram shows the concept of a nested hierarchy. A nested hierarchy is when there is a small watershed like maybe we were just looking at a small watershed, but it's a part of a larger watershed. And that watershed is a sub-basin of an even larger one, and so on and so on, until maybe the watershed area that we're looking at is the entire eastern United States. How much runoff there is depends on not only the size of the watershed, but also land use, like what, what they're putting over the surface, the soil type and how easily permeable the soil is, and then also terrain conditions like the slope of the soil. And then, of course, how much it rains is going to have a huge impact on how much runoff there is. And we'll revisit each of these parameters when we come and try and model watersheds using the WMS software. There are, there are ways to use GIS data to automatically calculate each of these parameters. So the movement of air is largely responsible for precipitation. Uh, if I was to say it in just one sentence, precipitation is caused by rising air. When there is humid air that rises, it cools off, and then it becomes super saturated, and so the moisture has to come out of the air because it rose, cooled off, and become oversaturated. So the movement of air is critical to being able to predict how much precipitation there is. And there's a little animation here that's showing if you have a marble that is going in a straight line on a spinning plate maybe, what sort of a curved path that takes. Now if you look at it from above, it looks like it went in a straight line. But then if you actually trace the path that it takes along the plate, it's curved. And uh, the analogy for that and how wind moves through the atmosphere is that Earth is a rotating sphere and air movement is going to be affected not only by temperature, but it's also going to be affected by the Earth's rotation. And so we're going to break that up into a couple of different uh, phenomena here. And one is called Hadley circulation. And Hadley circulation is just as easy as saying that there's warm air at the equator, and we know that warm air will rise, and so you can see that there is a general trend of rising at the equator, and then at the, po at the poles, the air is cooler, and so instead of rising, at the poles, the uh, air is falling downward. And so it's sort of like there's a belt of rising air at the equator, falling air at the poles. And if you combine that with the rotation of the Earth, there is what's called the Coriolis force, or the Coriolis effect. 
And it is what causes the actual uh, persistent um, wind directions that we're familiar with. Here in North America, we know that the air goes from the west towards the east. We have a westerly movement of the air. We just take it for granted that the weather in Cincinnati is coming towards us. You know, if it's raining, if there's a big storm in Cincinnati right now, maybe it will be here by dinner time. But that's not the case in everywhere in the globe. In some places, the weather goes from the east towards the west. And so what you can see is that there is rising air at the poles, falling, I'm sorry, rising air at the equator, falling air at the poles, and so we have a belt going this direction, a belt going that direction, and then there's a belt of air in between. And the combination of rotating Earth um, and the uh, Hadley circulation causes these typical trade winds. And here's a graph that, or here's a figure that shows it with uh, North America and South America. So you get an idea of what the typical patterns are like. Here in the U.S. we have the weather going from the west towards the east. And it looks like in much of Brazil the weather comes from the east and goes towards the west. And so it's, it's different in the, in the two locations. And because of those differences in air movement, there are also differences in precipitation by latitude. Now, precipitation is largely driven by solar radiation. There can't be rain unless there's evaporation first, because the evaporation gets the water from the ocean up into the atmosphere. What this is showing is that at zero latitude, meaning at the equator, there's typically a lot more precipitation on a global basis than as you get further away from the equator, the uh, temperature decreases, and so therefore the amount of average precipitation decreases. And so at the poles, it's actually very arid at the poles. Uh, down at 90 degrees south at the South Pole, there's hardly any precipitation there because the air is so dry. There isn't much driving evaporation, and so therefore there isn't very much to uh, cause precipitation. Jet streams are shown here. You know, here are the jet streams. And the jet streams are, I think they arise from the uh, interaction between two different belts. But jet streams aren't really pictured in this precipitation by latitude figure. This is just showing that on an average basis that uh, there's more precipitation at the equator than there is at the poles. And you can see that there's this interesting dip here, and that's um, because there are deserts at both uh, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Here's showing on a global basis where there's a lot of rain and where there's very little. The darker the, uh, the, darker the shading, the more precipitation there is. And so you can see that there's enormous precipitation, really high rainfall on an annual basis along the equator although there are some places close to the equator that have deserts. The Saharan Desert is maybe the prime example of that, but then there's also deserts in Central and Western Asia as well. So precipitation by latitude. This diagram is showing what's called spatial distribution, and this is one of the terminology that's on your list of concepts. Spatial distribution is just saying that there is variation in some property over space. And so if you were asked to draw an example of spatial distribution, you could draw something that looked like this, because this is showing in some space there's lots of rain, in some space there's very little. And if we just look at the United States, for example, I'm going to pull up a website that I intended to show you earlier, but it's a perfect illustration of spatial distribution. At Oregon State, they have a uh, very sophisticated weather mapping model that takes rain gauge data and averages it over areas. And so here's another illustration of spatial distribution. And this illustration is just for the month of September, but the trend is that there's very little rainfall 
in the western United States, and we have plenty here in the east. And it makes me glad that I don't live in the west anymore. I used to live in the western United States. I'm glad I've moved because things aren't going to get much better for them as far as rainfall shortages. But back to the issue of spatial distribution, this just shows that there isn't an even amount of precipitation across space. There is variation with space. Um, besides the uh, figures that we've already seen, there's also variation in precipitation that's due to um, the fact that at different latitudes there's a lot of land versus very little land and water heats and cools more slowly uh, than land does. So land can heat up and cool off quickly and water heats up and cools down slowly and so at latitudes where there's a lot of land the temperature can change more quickly than latitudes that have a lot of water. Um, Another issue is that the thermal equator, which is the center of the Earth as a function of temperature, shifts from year to year. It's not always exactly at zero degrees north that is the warmest part of the globe. Now, that gets pushed around based on variations in the jet streams and also monsoon locations where there's a pronounced wet season versus a, uh, a dry season. Here in the US, we have mostly it rains all through the seasons, but there are countries where, um, that's what this slide is showing that we had to skip over kind of quickly. There are some places where they have sort of like every year a dry drought period and then a wet period that it just pours for a really long time. We don't have that in most of uh, the United States. It's just in some parts of the West that we have pronounced dry season and then a wet season. Uh, and then one of the things that gets a lot of attention is the El Nino, especially when that causes heavy winds in California and can cause wildfires. But it's called the Southern Oscillation, and that is a, uh, a period of accumulating warm water in, in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And when there's that high concentration of warm water in one location, then it uh, sort of disturbs the equilibrium in the atmosphere and causes a lot of additional rainfall and wind coming through California and the Baja Peninsula. So those are some additional things. One other thing that's interesting to look at is how far clouds can travel. And what's illustrated in this figure is uh, an experiment where they tracked evaporation for um, a period of time and they, they tracked water that had evaporated from this cell and then they tried to identify based on the wind patterns and measuring how much it precipitated where that water was actually put down over what area. And you can see the very, very wide um, distances that can clouds can travel. And so the water movement is pretty extraordinary. And here's another experiment where they looked at the evaporation over Vietnam and found that that water was precipitating as far away as Flor you know, northern Florida, Georgia, South Carolina. And so this sort of shows in one way how risky it can be when there's pollution in one part of the globe because uh, that pollution can be traveling through the air many thousands of miles and uh, it's no stretch of the imagination that sulfur dioxide in the eastern United States can get up into Canada and cause acid rain for a long time. In Norway and Sweden, they suffered from acid rain coming from industrial cities in England. And so um, it's very easy to believe, based on these two figures, that water can move great distances through the environment. So measuring rainfall is accomplished with precipitation gauges. And here's a look at the precipitation gauges that exist in the, re the tri-state region here. Some of the best data is typically available at airports. And so at the tri-state airport, and at the Charleston Yeager Airport, there are uh, stations there that have data going back before the 1950s. And so that you can really analyze. Um, they have usually precipitation totals on a daily basis. So you can go back and look to see how much rainfall there's been on any day from now back into the 40s and beyond. 
the data that's available there um, varies based on how long it's been in service. This is sort of a national chart, and it's showing that there's, across the U.S., maybe uh, 50,000 rain gauges, but very few of them have been in operation for more than 100 years. And so remember that when we, when we have an IDF curve, we're interested in the 50-year storm and the 100-year storm, but we don't have that direct data at a lot of locations. We can't go to, um, if you look at back to the idea of Ona, West Virginia, there's no rain gauge in Ona, and there's especially no rain gauge that goes back 100 years. So for me to say what was the hundred, what is the hundred-year storm that I should use when I'm designing something in Ona, that really requires a lot of statistical extrapolation. I'm going to be, number one, spatially extrapolating because I'm going to have to average the rain gauge in Barbersville with the rain gauge in Hurricane, but maybe those don't go back very far, so I'll be uh, extrapolating between the Tri-State Airport and the Charleston Yeager Airport. Fortunately, um, there's a website that's already done all that heavy lifting for us, and it, it allows you to click anywhere on, the, on the, the map of the United States, and it will tell you the IDF curve for that location. I'll show you that website today. Um, we don't have very many gauges with a long duration of data, and if you look at other countries, there are some places that have uh, quite, a, quite a lot more gauges per kilometer. Um, in Israel, where it's a relatively small country and water is a very scarce resource there, they um, track precipitation very carefully, and so they have a high density of gauges. You can see nearly 0 .04 gauges per kilometer of area, but the average for the United States is much, much lower than that. There are big areas where we don't have any gauges at all and have to use statistical extrapolation instead. Uh, a hydrograph, you've written down that word before, it means a plot of rainfall depth or intensity versus time. And so you can look, here are two different storms. One of the storms, it looks like it was raining early on and then it tapered off to very low intensity after four hours. And then there was another storm on July 24th that it started with a low intensity but then it sort of jumped up and there was a higher intensity. So these on the vertical axis are intensities, and we can also look at those storms in terms of the total accumulation. And so those two storms, here's the January 8th storm, where it started raining very high intensity at first, but then it tapered off. And so the curve of that total accumulated depth is steep at first and then shallow after about four hours. And this graph has sort of a staggered start for the different uh, times so that they, they're not all on top, the curves aren't all on top of each other. So here's the July 24th storm starting at a time of zero. It started off slow and then suddenly there is a high increase in the accumulation. And so this is sort of the uh, intensity. Here's the accumulation which is the area under the curve corresponds to the intensity times the duration of the storm. IDF curves tell you both the intensity, the duration, and the frequency associated with certain amounts of precipitation. And so starting with intensity, over here on the vertical axis, it will tell you how many inches per hour or millimeters per hour you can expect for a certain return period storm. Each one of these curves is a different return period. And even if I didn't have labels on there, you should know that the bottom curve is a storm that comes around more frequently because it has the lower intensity. But the curve on top is going to be more rare, less common storm that will only come around maybe once every 100 years. Um, and then the duration of the storm that you need to select here on the x-axis corresponds to a calculated time of concentration. And so what it's saying is that you may have a storm that can achieve three inches per hour for a period of 10 minutes, but that same two-year storm, a storm that's only going to come around every two years, if it's expected to rain for a solid hour, it can't keep up that same intensity of three inches per hour. But 
If it's a solid hour of rain, it may only be one inch per hour as the intensity. So as duration increases, the total rainfall intensity, the average rainfall intensity over that duration decreases because of what clouds look like and how much of an area they can cover at any one time. Clouds are moving over an area. They don't stay motionless and steady. And so the, peer, the, the location of peak intensity is going to move over an area temporarily, and then it's going to move somewhere else. All right, this is the last thing I want to show you today, this um, procedure for calculating intensity, duration, frequency curves on your own. Because I told you there's a website where you can click on a location and it will give you the IDF curve. But I'd like you to understand a little bit about how they do that calculation. And it's according to this formula. If you have downloaded data and you know you've got a certain number of years of rainfall data for a gauging station, then you can calculate the total number of years of data as n, and then you rank all of the data, putting the highest storms at the top of the list and the lowest storms at the bottom. And then it's number one, line number two, line number three. That rank that you've got is m. And t is the return period that you can calculate from that procedure. And so let me show you an, uh, just a very quick illustration of that using a uh, data that I've downloaded from the NCDC. If you click on the NCDC, it takes you to a website where you've got three options. You can either, if you know the uh, zip code of the weather station you're interested in, you can click on the search tool. If you want to look on it on a mapping basis, mapping tool. But on the homework, I tell you to use this data tools because uh, it gives you some more powerful search options, the data tools. And so I'm going to click on find a station. And um, what I want is daily summaries. And the date range that I'm interested in, I want to get a lot of data going way back. And so I'm going to say I want data that goes back to 1950. You know, maybe September 13th, 1950, and apply. What it'll do is it'll highlight the weather stations that have data that goes back that far. And as I zoom in, it'll show more of the weather stations. Um, if I'm interested in the tri-state area, for example, it's dynamically changing that list of sites as I zoom in a little bit. And uh, here I think I see the tri-state airport. Here's the, uh, all right, lots of sites being shown there. Click on this one. It tells me that this is the Huntington Tri-State Airport. And I can, it, it has data available from 61 to uh, 2014. I can add that to the cart, and then it's, it's free. I go here. It's like a store almost, except for it doesn't cost anything. What you're going to need to download for your homework assignment is CSV data. That is comma-separated comma values. You can open it with a spreadsheet when it's a CSV. And you click Continue. It'll ask you for your uh, email address eventually. But what you need to make sure to tell it is that you want precipitation data. It, it has all this other data that we're not necessarily interested in just to find the uh, precipitation data. You don't need to know how much sunshine there was or what the air temperature was. We're just only interested in the precipitation. So you click Continue, and then you give it your email address and submit order. Yesterday, when I set up my order, it took them about five hours to fulfill it. It must have been that they had lots of other requests ahead of mine. So don't wait to the last minute to request the weather data you're going to need in the, uh, in the homework. But um, here you can see. Here's the email that I got from them telling me that my weather data was uh, ready to download. And so when I download that, it comes in as a CSV. And um, I can open it with Excel. And I want to sort it by highest to lowest. I don't care about snow. I'm going to get rid of these two columns because they're irrelevant. They're snow. Precipitation that's given here, that's tenths 
of millimeters. And so where it says 165, that means that there was 16.5 millimeters that day. So if I wanted to know inches of rain, then I would do this divided by 254. And then that would tell me how many inches of rain there was. And you can see that it's got the date expressed as, this is 1948. 08 means uh, August, and 01 means the first day of August. So here's the 2nd of August, the 3rd of August, and so on. What I'm interested to do is I want to sort this data from highest to lowest, largest to smallest. And so back in 1961, they got 5.6 inches of rain in 24 hours. So this is, uh, the rank is number one. This is the number two storm, the number three, the number four. Now the question I have is how much data is actually there? How many years of data? And the way I can do that is equals count and then this range. Now what I'm going to be doing on my computer, I could drag this down and it would take ages to get all the way to the bottom because there's going to be thousands of these. But instead of that, I'm going to do equals count and then click here and I'm holding down shift, control and the down arrow button and it goes all the way to the bottom of the list automatically and I press enter. And so this is how many days of data I have. So this is days of data. And then I want to know years of data. That's just going to be days divided by 365.25. That's how many days in a year if you account for leap years. So I have 66 years of data. Now going back to this formula that we had just a moment ago, it says that T, which is the return period, is T equals N plus 1 divided by M. So M is the rank. N is the number of years. Okay, so back to this spreadsheet, what that tells me is that return period, I have number of years of data, this, anchoring it, plus my rank, uh, plus one, divided by rank. So this 5.6 inches of rain is equivalent to the 67 year storm. The uh, 4.15 inches of rain is equivalent to the 33 year storm, and so on. So if I wanted to know what is the, uh, what is the 10 year storm, what should I do? If I want to know the 10 year storm, I have to do linear interpolation. So here's the 11 year storm and here's the 9 year storm. So the 10 year storm is going to be somewhere between the two. And so I could do a linear interpolation between these two depths. The same thing for the 25 year storm. The 25 year storm is somewhere between these two somewhere between 22 and 33. It's probably closer to 22, right? That's how linear interpolation works. And so the 25-year storm is going to be about 4.13. So um, this process that we've just gone through for a single rain gauge is what they do on the precipitation data frequency server. Uh, and this is the one where you can click somewhere on a map. You know, it starts off, here's my, uh, my marker. I'm going to move the marker on top of Huntington. And then as I scroll down, if I have this right now, I want it to be, let's say, um, I don't remember on the homework if I tell you to do intensity or depth. I say to do partial duration. Both. Oh, you need to do both. All right, so starting off with depth and partial duration, then here is the data that you can get from that. So part of the homework that you have, I'm giving you today, all you have to do is pick some city in America and get the IDF curve for it, and you can take this data 
and paste it into Excel. We'll talk more about this when we get together on uh, Thursday for class, but you can get started on the homework based on what we've covered already. Let me hand out this to you.